Good evening. A very warm welcome on a warm evening to the Oxford Martin School. Uh, for those of you that don't know the school or it's your first visit, uh, this is uh, what Chris Patton, when he opened it, called the intellectual crossroads of the world. Uh, it's an interdisciplinary group of about 400 scholars across Oxford working on the big challenges of the 21st century, and I was um, the, the founding director of it from 2006 uh, to 16, and now I have the pleasure of just running my own research groups here. This room used to uh, be the library, uh, these blinds which you can't see out of, which is a beautiful view down Broad Street uh, are closed because of the sun, but they were always closed before. And this red paint originally was bull's blood. Uh, now it's, of course, biodegradable and uh, very, very uh, good for us. But um, it's the same color it was in the 1880s, apparently. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome so many friendly faces, people who are friends and colleagues, uh, but also about 150 people online, including uh, Lillian Martin, whose um, husband, James Martin, endowed the school and is the reason we called the Oxford Martin School. I'm most delighted to see here Thomas Hoskins, who is the editor at Bloomsbury of the book I'm going to be talking about, The Age of the City which I co-authored um, with Tom Lee Devlin, who first started as my research assistant. Amazing, amazing guy. He was working at Bain at the same time as being my research assistant, uh, and then now is at The Economist. And if you listen to the Money Talks podcast, which he's hosting as we speak, uh, that's uh, what he anchors currently at The Economist, as well as writing. If you read stuff on the cities uh, in The Economist, it could well be his work. I did this book on cities because uh, I am concerned that we are lively, likely to be moving in a direction which is not going to be conducive to the growth and thriving of cities, uh, but also that if that happens, uh, we will be lost as humanity. So I believe passionately in cities, I believe that a place is more important than ever, and that we need to get our heads around uh, the significance of cities. It's something that I've been bubbling over in my mind over a long period of time, and this book had the longest gestation of any uh, book I've written. I first really was struck by this when I was working on my book, Age of Discovery, uh, in 2016, where I was trying to understand why Florence was so central to the Renaissance. Uh, but then also, of course, to the Inquisitions and the end of uh, the Renaissance that followed very soon after that. And came to realize that when ideas change more rapidly, and you have technological revolutions, uh, that place becomes more important. Then, of course, it was the Gutenberg Press uh, that had driven this I exponential growth in ideas. Before then, uh, ideas traveled very, very slowly. Uh, handwritten manuscripts, often in Latin, locked up in monasteries. And suddenly, you could get, often in your own language for the first time, affordable uh, things to read. Before that, only about 1% of Europe was literate. There was nothing to read and write for most people. And suddenly you had this extraordinary expansion in the desire to read and knowledge, which gave us the Renaissance. It led to this pollination of ideas that we associate not only, of course, with the arts, with the incredible breakthroughs uh, in art uh, that, that were of that period, 1450 to about 1500, but also in the sciences, discovering the world is round, that we uh, were not the center of the universe, the heavens rotated around other stars, etc. Uh, completely contradicting everything the church had been preaching uh, into it. An alternative voice, alternative ways of seeing things, uh, alternative perceptions, and that led to great tensions. But not only did this battle of ideas begin, uh, but also, of course, uh, massive destruction of jobs and wealth inequality soared. So the, the gold and the jewels, uh, the spices and furs that came back from the New World uh, were enjoyed by the Medicis and others, but most people continued to eat gruel and the scribes were put out of work. 
And so Savonarola, using this technology, inventing the political pamphlet, the Trump of the 1490s, lit the bonfire of the vanities and brought an end to the Renaissance. Of course, Luther separately, his sermons went viral too, uh, challenging things. What I was interested in not only is how the technological change had led to changes uh, in the way we saw the world, uh, but also why Florence was so central to this, and became convinced that as people heard about this, they had to be there. Uh, and more and more people in this very diverse city, about 30% uh, migrant Muslims and Jews being very central to the Renaissance, uh, went there. And so people from England and from around Europe and elsewhere had to be at this forefront of where civilization was changing. And the same is true today. Uh, you'll all be familiar with books uh, like Tom Friedman's The World is Flat, uh, or Francis Cancross, who was uh, the rector of Exeter College down the road's book, The Death of Distance, suggesting that with the revolutions of globalization of, that started in the early 90s, that place would become less important, that where you lived would matter less. Uh, and the revolutions were economic, the removal of uh, trade barriers, capital counter-liberalization. They were certainly political, the end of the Soviet Union, the opening of China, the Maastricht Treaty in Europe, uh, NAFTA in the Americas, and they were certainly technological, the development of the World Wide Web uh, in 1990, which really facilitated this. And with this explosion of interconnectivity and an ability to work from anywhere and to gain knowledge, we see cities very rapidly taking off in importance and the development of superstar cities around the world. Cities, of course, are a relatively recent phenomenon. Uh, for most of human history, very small share of the global population was urbanized at all. Uh, even at the peak of urbanization in the Holy Roman Empire, only about 15% of people were urbanized. So it was a minority place to be. And it was really only uh, with the Industrial Revolution that we see this takeoff of cities. Then, of course, located mainly because of natural resources, proximity to water, to drive water wheels, uh, to ports, to import slave cotton, uh, to coal mine, to coal fields and coal mines, uh, to be able to drive the machines uh, of the Industrial Revolution. But other things then came out of the revolution which led to this dynamic of cities becoming more effective. With power came elevators. Um, from about the 1830s, we had elevators. So height uh, began to uh, be possible. And buildings of 15, 30 floors were developed by the 1850s. Uh, of course, cooling and refrigeration allowed places to store food, which had not been possible before, which allowed much more control over food supplies into a city, which had always been the binding constraint on city development, the availability of food. And then a bit later, uh, of course, railroads, also very important, including the development of urban railroad systems like the London Underground, which allowed people to get around. And then later, from the early 1900s, uh, automobiles, the car allowing this mass development of cities. So cities have always been driven by technologies, by the availability of technologies uh, that allows people to come together. But as cities began to develop, we see this extraordinary association of cities with economic wealth and prosperity. And I argue with Tom in the book that it was cities that drove that. Because cities allow three remarkable things which do not happen uh, if people are dispersed. The first, they allow a level of cooperation between people that cannot be organized when people are much more dispersed. And that cooperation allows you to do things, to build infrastructure, to manage things in new ways, but also to build armies, uh, to plot. It allows a second thing which is even more important, which is specialization. 
you don't any longer have to be working in the field in order to eat supper. Uh, you can do different tasks. You can have an inter a division of labor, as Adam Smith envisaged, at a much higher level of specialization. And you get this wonderful ability of people to pursue their own interests and survive and do well. And the third thing that that leads to is invention and innovation. It's because people are able to specialize that they can be much more inventive, that they have the time, the thought, the resources to think in new ways, to do new things. And it's those three things coming together which lead cities to flourish. And they continue to be the reason today why cities uh, are two to three times more productive than other places. Perhaps a footnote on what I mean by, by cities. A very, <laughs> a very fraught topic, um, which I'll discuss very briefly, uh, because it's, uh, it could be a book in itself. Oxford, of course, is a city because uh, it has a cathedral. In China, it wouldn't really qualify as a fourth level town. Uh, in Iceland, it would be rather big. So where and how you think of cities uh, depends very much on a legal context, uh, some of which is rather archaic, like the one that operates in the UK, where there are cities of about 500 people. Um, though that wouldn't qualify, certainly, in most countries as a city. But I think it's important not to get too caught up in uh, this terminological debate because we know cities when we see them and because cities keep changing and morphing and often connect to other places. You get metropolitan areas, we have multiple small places becoming a big place, as indeed uh, has happened in London. But the magnetic impact of this generation of income in cities uh, remains as powerful as it ever has been. And we still see today this huge differential, which of course is the cause of many of the challenges I discuss in the book between how well people do in cities and how well people do in the rest of the countryside. And whether you can change that dynamic, the so-called leveling up agenda in the UK, is obviously a key political question. Not least in countries like the UK, where you have constituency politics, not proportional representation. The cities account for a growing share of the population, but politically, is often a very lagged effect of other places that account for much more uh, politically. And of course, in the US, the Senate is uh, two senators a state, uh, is even more lagged. So there are many places that would have no representation at the city level uh, that have many states in the US that have two senators, for example, uh, in the US Senate. So the political system matters, but if this has become a very, very significant issue. When I was working on subsequent books, Terry Incognito is my map book, uh, and I, one of the things in the climate chapter in that book, uh, which is reproduced here, but I discuss more broadly there, is what happens to cities with climate change and how will this tension between increasing concentration of people on coastal cities uh, be reconciled uh, with rising oceans and storms, etc. That was another driver to think afresh about cities. Uh, and then, of course, the pandemic, which was the subject of my book, Rescue, uh, changed a lot of things. And the question is, is what one thought about cities in the past now different? Are cities dead, as some would argue, because of remote work and the possibilities of remote work? And some of my, you might be following what's going on in San Francisco at the moment, for example. Uh, where people are talking about a death spiral uh, in San Francisco. Now, this is of extreme consequence of, for humanity. Why? Well, one is just the numerical obviousness of it, uh, which is perhaps a, a trite point. But about 60% of humanity lives in cities now. So if cities don't succeed, if we can't overcome poverty in cities, if we can't make cities thrive, then humanity, or at least 60% of humanity, uh, cannot thrive. And that is growing very rapidly. So by 2050, we'll have about 80% of the world's population uh, in cities. So cities are already, and every day more so, the place where people are, 
And so if you want to solve the problems people are facing, you need to solve them in a city context. That's pretty clear. But cities could also be both the amplifiers of the problems uh, or the sources of the solutions. And we've always seen this historically. We know that all major civilizational changes, and we'll go back to, to the Renaissance, but that's only one example, have come from cities. There's lots of reasons for that. One is the specialization. It's also because the cities tend to be where politicians listen and hear, where people come together and form revolutions, food riots, and other things. Cities are very politically powerful, uh, but it's also because of this creativity that comes out of cities. Cities are the idea space in which the future is shaped. So if we don't shape the future in cities, we're not going to shape it. If we don't address the problems of climate change, of stopping pandemics, uh, of generating wealth, of overcoming inequality, these other great challenges that we face for the coming century uh, in cities, we're not going to address them, both because of the numerical uh, obviousness of it, but also because that's where the answers have to come from. So if that is the case, the downside risks are also enormous. Cities are the place where the greatest threats are as well. We've seen this historically as well, uh, and these are now compounded because we know cities are the incubators of pandemics. We know that they heat islands that are particularly vulnerable to climate change. Uh, and we know uh, that they are increasingly, as is we see in San Francisco, at threat uh, of rising inequality and urban poverty. So that's why we decided to do a book on cities. It covers a very wide range of, of different issues, uh, but let me just give you some sort of sense of the flavor of them and then I'll open it up uh, for discussion. Perhaps the most important question is whether, the new question is whether remote work is likely to change the dynamic of cities. And what we've seen with remote work is that essentially professionals who are relatively wealthy uh, are able to work from elsewhere for a significant share of the time. And it's settled at about 30% uh, of the time. Uh, people tend to now be going in about three days a week uh, in the US, in Canada, uh, across Europe and the UK. Typically, Tuesdays to Thursdays are more flexible hours. For them, of course, it's very nice. They've got long weekends every weekend. Um, they typically have their own home office uh, in a, with a lovely garden outside, uh, and it's all very pleasant, and I enjoy it too. The question is, what's the impact of this, and is it a good idea? Should we be telling people that they need to go back to the office, uh, and what are the likely implications? If it does settle, which I think it will, at around this sort of level. Well, then, the initial evidence is that it is exacerbating inequalities dramatically. Uh, it's likely to, I believe, lead to a collapse in productivity and creativity, uh, and that it needs to be addressed quite comprehensively, not by forcing people back into cities on Mondays or Fridays, but by thinking more about how you make cities livable places. Why, why is it having these effects? Well, most professional jobs are, in fact, apprenticeships. Right? Most jobs are apprenticeships. People learn uh, not by a one-way conversation on Zoom, which a superior person decides the timing of uh, and the length of, but through informal interactions of all types. Uh, this is both the sort of coffee cooler type of, uh, the coffee machine uh, type of conversation, but also just a more continuous observation of how people behave, how they develop corporate cultures, uh, how they spark off each other. And it's a place where very informally you can challenge. It's very difficult, and I'm sure you've all had too many Zoom conversations or Teams conversations for your own liking. Uh, it's very difficult to challenge uh, in that sort of formal setting, especially if it's being recorded, which increasingly uh, it is. 
It also is, in my view, uh, the case that it tends to be the more senior people who think they know what they're doing uh, that are working remotely and more junior people often going in. Uh, that's a problem for multiple reasons, but one of them is that uh, where, where younger people uh, are confined to working at the end of their bed uh, or bed sit, and often with a small child uh, or others that are sort of around and distracting, uh, lack of privacy because they don't have large homes, uh, and of course, lack of boundaries about work-life balance. The more senior people can make choices about when and how they engage, but basically your home office becomes a 24-hour uh, office. You cannot exit it uh, very, very easily. There's evidence regarding rising mental illness uh, associated with this. Of course, the pandemic led to a massive spike uh, in loneliness uh, and all, a very wide range of, of mental illnesses. Uh, but that is being sustained uh, in many cases by the loneliness that comes from remote work, uh, particularly amongst young people. Very difficult for people to arrive. There's also increasing evidence that people that work, young people that work remotely are less likely to be promoted uh, and succeed. So it's quite debilitating, debilitating um, for young people to be in that environment. But if you're telling young people they need to go in and of course form what what workplaces are, uh, networks, sources of skill transfer, uh, exchange, cultural development, um, and, and uh, opportunities to learn. Uh, if you're telling young people that they should come in more regularly, then I think it's also necessary that older people go in, that the senior people go in. Otherwise, what's the point uh, if the mentors are not going to be uh, in the workplace? Be that as may, uh, most places have settled uh, on this three-day week. So what does that do? It means that we have a massive, and it's good to see Andrew here, who's a real uh, expert on real estate, on property. Um, we have a real crisis uh, in, in the property sector, uh, as a very significant share of offices are at very low occupancy rates, 70% occupancy or lower. Uh, and that means that we are seeing uh, not only bankruptcies and failures to pay, uh, but a contraction of the office space in cities with a lot of empty uh, and vacant offices. That, of course, reduces the income stream uh, of cities who depend on office uh, rates uh, and payments. But not only that, it destroys the ecosystems around offices. Uh, the barbers and the baristas, uh, the cleaners and everyone else uh, that depend on this. There are many, many small businesses that service commuters, basically, uh, people coming in. It also destroys the financial model for public transport systems, uh, which depend on mass commute. We saw them severely impacted by the pandemic, these businesses and public transport systems. Uh, but the recovery uh, has been impossible uh, for both. Uh, that leads to a lot of small businesses closing, a lot of shops closing in central business districts, uh, and uh, the problem, which even in Oxford you see, if you walk down Corn Market, you see the number of boarded up shops, uh, much more, much more acute um, in, say, CBD of London. So, when cities start losing finances, uh, we start seeing the dangers that the debt spiral in, uh, or the fear of the debt spiral in San Francisco uh, points to, uh, which is lose income, you lose investment potential. You re reduce your services, you reduce your maintenance, you reduce your police force, you reduce your ability to house people, etc. And you very quickly have uh, incapacitated local authorities. Meanwhile, of course, where people are working, often have lower taxes. People fleeing New York, uh, going to low tax locations, uh, like Florida, uh, for example, uh, so that, they, that everyone is, is losing in that process. What this also, of course, is connected to, and rather strangely has not yet uh, impacted on, 
is the problem of affordability of major cities. Uh, and it's not, people are not working remotely because they cannot afford to live in London. It tends to be the professional classes uh, who work remotely. But young people uh, and people en trying to enter into London or New York or many, many other cities, uh, including, of course, San Francisco still, uh, face this extraordinary uh, high cost of particularly accommodation. Uh, the reason for this is a combination of various factors, uh, which I believe have their roots in the 1980s uh, and a whole series of things that were happening there. The one, of course, is the Thatcher-Reagan revolution, uh, which particularly in the UK uh, led to the collapse of investment in public housing uh, and the privatization of public housing, uh, so that, as well as a great slowing of new build. So we're seeing uh, the availability of uh, public housing dramatically declined. I think it's lower today than it was in the 1960s, for example, uh, in the UK. The, the second big dimension to this, which relates to the growing inequalities within and between cities, is what globalization did do, is it led to the offshoring of most manufacturing jobs uh, and the out, the leaving of the advanced economies, of the jobs that used to employ people, particularly in the places that were there because of their location. The Grimsby's of the world, the Sheffields, uh, the Midwest cities of the US, of course, the Detroit's had gone earlier. Um, but cities that were dependent on manufacturing often located there because that was where the manufacturing historically had developed. C in, this was two factors going on. One was it was going to low-cost locations, but also economies were transforming internally because as we get richer, we, a smaller and smaller share of our income is spent on product. We are dematerializing as a share of our income. We go from manufacturing to massages in what we spend money on. We don't buy more and more cars or more and more fridges or more clothes, or most of us don't. Um, we put it into psychological services uh, which are particularly good in big cities where there's high professionals of food of high and higher quality more and more expensive restaurants services of a very wide variety including of course entertainment of a wide variety and that process which accelerated from the 1980s uh, was particularly bad for destroying jobs in manufacturing cities, and for create, it was particularly good for creating jobs in metropoles, in dynamics, thought, knowledge economy cities, the professional services, banking, law, technology, took off from the 90s. So partly servicing this global flows, lawyers and finances that were serving global flows in globalization. And they benefit greatly from specialization and knowledge effects. So the growth of New York, of London, of Paris, uh, is explained as by this acceleration of the knowledge economy. Now, the dynamics of knowledge economies uh, are very different to the dynamics of previous economies that led to the growth of a more dispersed city system, mainly because you know, talent war. Knowledge economies are basically about where do people want to be and they can be anywhere. They can take their trade elsewhere. So place becomes more and more and more important. And then particularly if you're in a talent war, you, only, you not only want to get the professionals, but you want to get young talent. And there are very few places that can win in a talent war because people want diversity and specialization. They want to be with people that are like them. Their age group, their type of music, their gender identification, whatever it is, they want to cluster. And that is what defines the development of London, New York, and many other places. Often moving into places that were previously occupied by much lower income people, the gentrification process, which we see in all knowledge economy cities. That gentrification process is driven by people on relatively high incomes in these service professions. And of course, they are served 
by people on low income. The cleaners, the cooks, the nannies, uh, the people that work in the stores, the nurses in the hospitals, the teachers in the schools, etc. How you manage that is the problem of affordability. It was also fed by very low interest rates for a very long time. Uh, the asset price bubbles, the ability of people to leverage their income uh, at a great level. So we have this paradox. We have cities uh, where huge wealth generation, which increasingly are unaffordable uh, to most people that need to get there. And um, when you ask people, as I did when I did a BBC series uh, called After the Crash, why don't you move if you're unemployed in the Midwest of the US, say, or in the north of England, why don't you move to where the jobs are? The answer you get is always related to, I can't afford to. In the US, people often have ne negative equity on their houses. In other words, their house was worth less than when they bought it after the financial crisis. Uh, I can't afford a, a home there. Or I can't get my kids into school there. Or I've got an elderly parent in a care home that, or living with me and I can't take them because I can't afford to keep them and I can't afford the care there. This affordability question combined with this increasing frictions in public transport are a large part of the reason why the world has become much more spiky, not flat. If you can get there and you can get the jobs, you can do it. But if you can't, it's actually your adjusted income. If you take someone from the Midwest who's unskilled, that does not have a tertiary education, or from the north of England that's unskilled, that does not have a tertiary education, that's not going to get a knowledge economy job, they're going to get a job servicing the knowledge economy. And you move them to, say, London or New York, they're likely to be worse off because of the, the cost that they're going to be, the amount they're going to be spending on accommodation. Uh, and some other services. Public transport has also become much more pricey, much more congested, and takes much more time. So the quality of their life is likely to deteriorate uh, in that process. And so what you get is people stuck in the past, basically. You get this rigidity in the system, which means that you have huge demand and thriving places where people are, some people are doing relatively well, uh, and other places that are left behind. And that is the challenge of leveling up. And it has dramatic political consequences. I believe it's this process which was supercharged by the financial crisis, which meant that a lot of people in these other places lost their jobs, and no bankers really did. Um, and lawyers, of course, did very well out of the financial crisis, uh, trying to sort out the mess. It was that process uh, of being stuck, of not being able to have your kids do better than you did, of not being able to grab the opportunities of the future that I believe lies behind the growing anger that we're seeing in populism. I believe it lies behind what we saw in Brexit, uh, the anger with the metropolitan elite who are doing very well, and not only are they doing well, they created the financial crisis uh, and they don't care about us, we are left behind. So addressing affordability concerns uh, is absolutely central. Now, can you level up by basically just spreading the wealth? Let the big cities enjoy themselves, uh, but take their money, uh, or better still, slow down their growth, which is what has been suggested. That, could that be an option? And I believe that's very dangerous, uh, and talk about it in the book. And the reason is that these dynamic cities are the geese that are laying the golden eggs of our economy. They are the drivers of progress, the sources of creativity. And if you try and stifle that, and you can stifle in many ways, and this government's doing a pretty good job on multiple dimensions, uh, low investment, stopping migrants, uh, etc., cetera, uh, creating a very uncertain playing field, uh, underinvesting in public transport. If you, if you start slowing the growth of your dynamic cities, you're slowing the engine of growth of your whole economy. Uh, and if you really try to take the, the resource out of it, what you're going to do is 
achieve leveling down, not leveling up, uh, where everyone will be worse off uh, in long term. That is not to say that you cannot create dynamic other places. The UK is quite small, so I cannot envis envisage in the UK that you could do much more than have one or two other clusters of success in the UK. For example, one could imagine a northern powerhouse, which has been talked about, if you had high-speed rail between it, and if you were able to make it a great place for people to be, where young people want to be, where in this talent war, you're going to have a chance of winning out against London, because it's more affordable, it's closer to beautiful places, whatever reasons you might be able to package together to create a wonderful space. But simply saying, you know, to 20,000 civil servants, we're going to disperse you in the north of England, uh, as is happening, is not going to create better economic growth in the north of England. It's not going to solve this fundamental problem. So the politics of leveling up uh, become incredibly important, and of course the economics are very, very complicated. I do believe that it has to happen through a number of things. The one is tax and redistribution, so tax the wealthy, particularly change the rate system so that property values reflect wealth uh, as they don't at all today. Um, redistribute it, guarantee minimum standards around the country so everyone uh, should have a post office if they need it, a clinic if the, certain, if the population uh, justifies its schools and other services. They certainly should have broadband and internet fiber, uh, minimum standards. And of course, by helping people move to where the jobs are, by giving people the options. So things like housing vouchers, massive investment in affordable housing. And there, perhaps, what's happening to offices can give us opportunity. Some share of vacant offices could be turned into residential accommodation. If you contrast, for example, Shoreditch in London uh, to Canary Wharf or uh, the area around Bank, you see the difference between a vibrant area which has a combination of offices and residential and entertainment that's open 24 hours where there always are people on the streets, but they're also very dense offices or people working, and a place which is simply dedicated towards office. And I think that whole idea, which was an idea really developed by Robert Moses um, in the US uh, of CBDs, where you would drive in and out uh, along some highway, leaving the poor in inner cities, you go to your wealthy suburbs, come back to work. That whole idea is an uh, idea which I think will be of the past. I think we should be moving towards much more combined spaces uh, in inner cities, the 15-minute city where you work, entertain, uh, etc. Hopefully we'll also be moving to very cleaner cities uh, as we move to a world of zero carbon and renewables, where parking lots can become vertical farms, uh, where we are able to recycle water, where we are able to do many things. Let me just spend uh, the last 10 minutes on some of the other issues uh, that which I discuss in the book. Climate change, of course, uh, is going to have a devastating impact on many, many cities. Cl cities tend to be heat islands. They tend to be about, depending on the nature of construction of the city, the density, etc., maybe five degrees warmer uh, than the countryside uh, around them. Uh, and therefore, people are going to suffer first from acute heat, uh, very high wet bulb temperatures, which will make it impossible to do work outside, like construction work, say, uh, or street cleaning work. So that's one sort of problem. And many people, of course, don't have air conditioning, uh, not least uh, poorer people. And in the UK, a very high share of people don't have air conditioning. If you're wealthy enough, you can live in a cocooned bubble of air conditioning. You know, one of the interesting things to watch is the is uh, house prices and the growth of places like Phoenix, Arizona, or Las Vegas, which are in the desert where it's often 40, 50 degrees outside and there's absolutely no water. So, but the wealth levels are high enough that people can live in 
cocooned air conditioning uh, and pump water from further and deeper. But in the UK, we don't have that option, and most people around the world where the growth is of cities don't have that option. So creating cities which are not going to be heat island, that requires massive greening of cities, uh, walling our buildings with green, roofing our buildings with green, and of course reducing the emissions that generate the heat, mostly from transport and heating systems or buildings within cities. That's one direction of travel. A much more difficult direction of travel, uh, I think, is the question of what happens to cities that will simply be submerged. And in the book, I have these maps of what various cities will, will look like. Uh, and you can go online and look and play with different scenarios, depending what you think uh, global temperatures are going to look like and their impact on the Arctic, Antarctic, and uh, Himalayan ice caps. But whatever it is, I'm convinced it's going to be at least a meter and probably uh, well over two uh, this century with a lot of storm surges uh, a lot of saline intrusion and um, flooding, uh, including from in, in deltas, which will mean that anywhere uh, that is like Miami, uh, for example, uh, parts of Los Angeles, parts of London, but certainly Dakar in Bangladesh, Mumbai, Jakarta, um, Lagos are basically very significant parts of these cities which are home to between 10 and 30 million people uh, cannot be sustainable. So what one does about that is a major question and there are lots of options around that, but including thinking very carefully about how you encourage city to grow to higher levels. But cities are also the source of solutions and that's because per capita carbon emissions in cities are much lower than they are uh, in the countryside. We travel less when we're in a city. We don't drive around. Uh, we don't require as much heating because typically our homes are not, um, uh, are not isolated. Uh, they're apartment blocks or we in terraced houses or whatever. We need less heating. Uh, and so uh, what we want, of course, is to try and preserve as much of nature as we, as we can, uh, have ecological diversity, and that requires that we don't populate the whole of the countryside, particularly in a small country like the UK. Uh, this is a massive issue. And that we concentrate people happily uh, in cities where they will be much more ecological. Their footprints will be much lower. How one does that, of course, depends on what you do with your energy systems, your water systems, uh, heating systems, etc., in cities. Um, but it also depends on how we think about construction. Unfortunately, concrete, cement, and steel are amongst the most carbon-intensive materials. Uh, and when you look at the projected construction of cities over the coming decades, uh, you know uh, that that's just another reason why sticking to two degrees is impossible because of the carbon emission of the whole system. We also don't know yet how to make steel without coal, which is another uh, sort of problem at scale. Um, see John nodding his head, but the scale of what's required moving to, say, green hydrogen uh, for, uh, for steel making uh, needs to be amplified. So there's a whole of technological, economic, and other incentives that need to change, including the way we think about cities, uh, that is absolutely vital to address climate change. And I think it's no exaggeration to say that our battle uh, on climate change is gonna be won or lost uh, in cities. Of course, in developing countries, that's where the massive, massive growth is. Pandemics, similarly, uh, are uh, principally derived from urban areas as the coming together of people, uh, animals, in often unsanitary conditions near transport hubs, typically airports, but also rail, rail hubs. And it's that interconnectivity, what I, the, the nodes of um, what I call the butterfly defect of globalization, which you can either amplify or short circuit uh, in cities. 
And so how cities are able to become the place where we stop pandemics, the sh where we short circuit pandemic transfer, is a key question uh, for us to thrive in the future. The book is optimistic because it's based on my understanding of cities as agents of change, of the places where we find solutions. That's always been the case, and I believe it will continue to be the case. But how you make cities thrive, become more rapid agents of change, and how cities overcome the stark inequalities within them and between them and the rest of the countries, how they address these massive challenges we face, uh, like climate, like pandemic, like the politics of populism, is something that I believe requires further attention. And I hope after reading the book, it will have convinced you that if I haven't found all the answers, at least I've asked many of the right questions. Thank you very much. So we have about uh, 25 minutes. There's, uh, I think, 150 people online. So we'll alternate between the room and online. And um, Clara at the back has a roving mic. This is being broadcast and recorded. So if you don't want to be heard, I suggest you don't speak. <laughs> um, who'd like to go first? Toby. Uh, so thanks so much for that for that talk, Ian. Um, you were describing something that uh, there's a word I would have used to to capture it, which is systemic or system. I mean, at the end of the day, cities are systems. They're complex systems. Mm. They're adaptive systems, and um, it's important that we view them in that way, because the problem you were describing of people working at home. You, you, you captured all the kind of systemic elements in that. Um, so just wondering, is, was there a reason why you didn't use the word system? Or is, you, did, <laughs> you did use it at the, yeah. once um, at the very end. Um, I just want to make one other point, and that's, that's about the importance of design. Everything around us in a city is designed, has go, goes through a process of design by a set of professionals. And talking about the scale of transformation that needs to happen in cities, particularly in, in developing countries, where are those skills going to come from? Yep. So, uh, as, as, as I think you know, <laughs> I have written books where systems are at the heart of it, like the butterfly effect, defect, uh, which is a, basically a systems book. Um, I'm trying to make this book as intelligible, along with Tom, who, who writes so well, uh, to as many people as possible. And to be sort of useful for those that don't necessarily have a conceptual framework, uh, such as the systems thinking. While I certainly think of the world through, I think, a systems thinking lens, I, don't, I think it often uh, creates a fog uh, because the problem with systems is that everything is connected to everything else. Uh, that's what a system is. And disentangling cause and effect, uh, finding one's way through a very complex web uh, is extremely difficult. And I think often perplexes people, uh, makes them feel that they are not agents in the system. And the lens, so the lens I'm using is rather approaching it from the perspective of multiple dimensions that I think people will feel identify with, uh, be part of in themselves and empower them to act. So whether it's a young person and what they're doing, or a remote worker, or someone who cares about climate change, uh, or someone who cares about inequality or politics, those are the lenses of the chapters of the book. Uh, and 
it, you know, I'm not saying one's right and one's wrong. It's just the way that, that we found it effective to do it. But clearly systems thinking is important. Design, yes. Um, sort of complete, uh, something which is totally unrelated to my day job here, which is running these research groups on the future of work and technological and economic change and the future of development, is that I got very involved in Ukraine uh, and working on a task force um, led by Norman Foster. Uh, on how to reimagine the future of Ukrainian cities. And, um, and, and that's been absolutely fascinating because it's all about design and designing. In that case, we often, you do tragically have an almost blank slate uh, because everything's been destroyed. And so you can start again and how would you design a, a city for the 21st century? Uh, so um, absolutely, I think design is important, but. You know, we, we are sitting, not least in Oxford, uh, with, the, with the weight of history uh, on, every, on every corner and in every room that we, we are, uh, <coughs> that we're in. Uh, and so uh, these things were not designed for the 21st century. Uh, they were designed in different periods for different purposes. And how you repurpose uh, them becomes, I think, the biggest challenge. Not least offices, by the way. A lot of offices can't be repurposed. Uh, to accommodation because they're just so bad. There's no light. Uh, the, the, the materials are not appropriate. People won't want to live in them. You're going to condemn people to the sort of thing people got condemned to in the big old apartment uh, skyscrapers of council housing. Uh, so that's one of the design questions. Yeah, was there someone back there? Yeah, right in the back. <coughs> Yeah, uh, thanks, Ian. That was the former very... Lord Mayor of Oxford, no less. <laughs> <laughs> that was very intelligible and very persuasive, of course, as usual. But I wanted to ask a, a slightly different question. Um, people often talk about wanting to escape from the rat race, and I wondered if you'd had a chance to look at people's happiness or well-being in cities as opposed to being in the countryside. Yeah, there's a lot of discussion about... Um, these things, and it goes back a long way, I, you know, uh, Blake and his dark satanic mills. Um, 1807, I think. Uh, and, um, and obviously uh, Dickens, uh, Oliver Twist, and uh, Karl Marx, uh, and, and Engels uh, wrote extensively about how horrible cities were. And indeed, a lot of religious writers have also written about how terrible cities are, how corrupting they are, how bad they are, and basically this ideal of the countryside or another place. In fact, I'm not convinced, I mean, those were horrible places, and I'm sure they were all remarking on, on how just how terrible and polluted uh, life was uh, then, not least in the industrial cities, uh, and people forced into them by the enclosures and many other things. Today, um, there's not much evidence uh, that people in the countryside are happier than people in cities. Certainly not young people. If you look at, you know, how do we, how, what, do we, what do we mean by well-being or happiness? Uh, you look at life expectancy, look at suicide, look at depression, uh, and I know there's some doctors here who probably have a much better handle on this. Um, look at these indicators uh, of it. Certainly if you're in a city that's in a death spiral, uh, like the cities of the Midwest in the US, you get what Angus Deaton, the Nobel Prize winner, calls the diseases of despair. Because there's no job, there's no network, there's no meaning in the city for you other than welfare payments. Uh, would you be happier elsewhere? I don't know. Um, but if you look at loneliness as a phenomena, for example, there's no evidence that, lo that loneliness rates in cities are higher than they are for the equivalent populations outside. And, if, and, and as people increasingly define themselves in ways that are very different to their parents, young people, in terms of their gender identity, other identities, uh, I think uh, there's nothing worse for some people than being stuck in a village uh, or being stuck in the homogenous suburbs uh, where they don't fit in and they aren't like-minded people. Uh, and that's why young people want to be in cities, uh, because, that, because they can... Now, being lonely, you know, the, this, this tension between 
being lonely and isolated in the densest places on earth is certainly there. And, sit, and Marina Hertz wrote a great book on, on, on loneliness where she talks about uh, some cities, and particularly single people, and the pandemic exacerbated this, uh, where you have 50% uh, of young people are living on their own, for example. Uh, that's, and then you're working remotely uh, or very lonely. But, but I don't believe that, um, that it's necessarily so, and I think we can work very hard in cities, and I know you did this in Oxford uh, and, and continue to in the district council as well, to make cities uh, much more social places. One of the devastating things that happened in the pandemic, which has been maintained, and it was started, I think, by Thatcher, was the destruction of community centers, social clubs, sports facilities, and all of libraries, these places where people went for community in cities and in small places. And it's those places which are so vital uh, to, to overcome this for people uh, in cities. So how one constructs a city and how one deals with this, I think, is absolutely central. Yeah, do you want to do something online, Clara? Um, yeah, so Anita has asked, um, don't you find CBDs like Canary Wharf are so soulless and lonely? And is this because it misses the pure, pure heart of a um, human city? Yeah, um, they, they are particularly now, and I don't know how many of you have gone into the CBDs um, since the pandemic. Uh, you know, they used to be bustling uh, during the day and then empty out at night. Now they're often not even bustling in the day. Uh, and certainly on a Monday or Friday. So I think that, that, that is a big, big challenge. And I think it's one of the things we're coming to recognize. Certainly if we want to move away from societies that are car dependent, that are commuting in and out, uh, and until we get better public transport, I think the concept that there's a separate place where we go for work uh, and live and entertain uh, is something that will be, look at, be looked at rather like we look at period uh, previous periods of urban development as being a very strange idea that was of that time, uh, but is not what humans should be doing. Um, yep. Why don't you take that and then come down here. Yep. I want to link together the question about happiness and um, friendliness and so on. So I come from a dark satanic mill town of Wigan and I now live in the genteel but faded town of Bexhill-on-Sea. And I moved there from Copenhagen after 20 years. The house was magnificent, right by the sea. The town was faded, full of charity shops, full of old people. It has the, the record for old people in the country. And I stopped a jury's worth of people in the town and said, have you lived here longer than five years? And if so, why? <laughs> and to a person, they reflected and said, very friendly, very friendly people here. So we decided to move there from Copenhagen and help to kind of re renovate the town. One of the key things you find is that so many low, uh, old people are there and they are very lonely. And one of the things that people are trying to work out is our generation, born in 47, if you went to university, we have been the most privileged generation ever in our view. As we age between 75 and 85, we are gonna become a burden on our kids or the state. And that's not good enough. There are now two workers per pensioner, there used to be four. So we have a real problem. Could people, by design, not uh, of my generation, uh, live in sort of decentralized communes of the sort we had in the 60s, but a bit more genteel, a bit more uh, individual space and so on, and thereby live together, and the name we're gonna call it is Wits End, <laughs> and <laughs> thereby relieve the pressure on uh, our kids and the state for at least 10 years, uh, uh, on average, and also help to deal with this loneliness thing because some of our university friends, the females, are lonely because the husbands have died or they've kicked them out. And they're thinking, when I fall ill in the next 10 years, who's gonna look after me? But if we can put them in this commune, we'll all look after each other. So, sounds like a, a, a lovely idea. I hope you get it going. I'm gonna need it soon. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like an excellent idea. But, but you point to another factor, which is demographics uh, and um, the rapid collapse in fertility in many countries, not so much the UK, but you certainly see it in many European countries, uh, and you see it uh, with dramatic impact in Japan, uh, for example, and parts of China. 
uh, and, and what the structure of cities is going to look like and how you, when you're thinking about cities of the 21st century, uh, increasing share of them will be elderly. Uh, and so that has very, very significant implications too. Thanks, yep. Ian, for bringing all this complexity to mind. Um, getting any of this better is going to require a, an appropriate political environment. Mm. Can you think of any political ideology or party, either in the UK or in the world, that might be up to the challenge? Yeah, you know, the reason um, why I write books is because I'm trying to change people's minds. Um, and that's a process of spreading ideas and engagement. And I think when you look, I mean, the great thing about cities is that there are so many experiments. And a lot of what can be done in cities can be done by the cities themselves, by local authorities or in the US, by states, for example. So one doesn't need, one doesn't need often a national government to achieve extraordinary things within a city, particularly if you have revenue raising capacity. And it's one of the things that I think really needs to happen is a decentralization of revenue raising capacity to allow cities to do different things. Um, even in a in rather a strongly centrally controlled society like China, the level of experimentation in cities is quite extraordinary. Uh, and that's one of the ways people succeed up the slippery pole there is by having done interesting experiments uh, in their city so that have succeeded. So I think Firstly, I, I don't think we need to rely on, on national politics, and if we do, we, we might be waiting too long. Um, but secondly, I think that the, the, it is happening. Uh, if you look at, you know, I don't, do, as you might have heard, I don't agree with the whole leveling up agenda, but behind it is a real need for a serious conversation about growing inequality and what to do about it. Uh, it's, it, it has to be addressed. Uh, I certainly don't agree with most of what Trump stands for, everything that Trump stands for. But behind it is a growing anger with this failure to redistribute wealth within the US, the haves and the have-nots. Uh, and I think so working out how we can create a positive political agenda that addresses that is what is needed. Uh, and I, I, think, I do see glimmers of hope. Um, you know, and, and there are lots of different ways to, to, to do this. An interesting question is whether high-speed train, ra train rails increase inequality or decrease it between cities. This is the Fr great French experiment, for example, or great Chinese experiment. It's certainly not the great British experiment. <laughs> um, and the evidence is that they do allow for a redistribution of income. Uh, and they, 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 they've slightly flattened France, for example, and China. Because people can work and go home at weekends and knowledge workers feel much more comfortable that they're not isolated by being in other places because they can go back to where they want to be at the weekend uh, or, or so on. So I think there, there's some really interesting experimentation coming, uh, coming out on this. Um, how are we doing for time? All right, we've got 10 minutes. Yeah. Uh, David, then the other David. And then we'll, okay, yeah. Uh, lovely talk, I enjoyed it so much. I enjoyed that so much, thank you, Ian. Um, and you characterized uh, this, the, the um, motivations for increasing density and the consequences of increasing density uh, with respect to factors that people weren't considering before, but they become very evident now. And I'm wondering if there is also associated with that uh, a need for flattening the, the firm. So if firms want to build larger and larger campuses, then um, people are gonna have to come to those firms. But if you want to distribute, flatten the density a little bit of the city so that you don't have to have a thousand people coming to this office, but only 50 here, 50 here, 50 here, 50 here, or whatever, some distribution of that, then the firm has to decide that that's economically efficient. Would you like to comment a bit on that uh, sort of more yeah. micro account? Yeah. I mean, there's an interesting uh, parallel development of superstar firms and superstar cities. Uh, and clearly Silicon Valley would not exist 
uh, without Google and Apple, a few other firms, but they wouldn't exist without Silicon Valley. They, come, they are the product of this engine of specialization, uh, universities, people, young people, innovation, uh, driving change, and wanting to do things differently. If you, I'm a strong believer that we need much stronger antitrust policy, competition policy, etc., <laughs> to have less concentration of wealth <coughs> and power in firms. Uh, I think that is very unhealthy. Whether that would lead to a flattening of urbanization in a way, I am skeptical. Because if you look at the data on startups, uh, for example, uh, you see that they are hugely overrepresented in dynamic cities. And that goes back to, because who goes to dynamic cities? People who are very innovative, people, and because they find the things they want. They find the capital, they find the people, they find uh, the materials they need to experiment. And of course, another factor which I haven't mentioned yet, uh, but which <laughs> is the subject of the current book I'm working on, migrants. Um, migrants are hugely overrepresented in, in these dynamic cities. Uh, they were in Silicon Valley in San Francisco. Try and think of an iconic Silicon Valley firm that is not migrant founded or second generation migrant founded. Uh, and, um, and, as, and migrants feel much more at home in dynamic cities because they are, find like minded people uh, and identity. So I'm not, I think. Flattening firm structure is good for many reasons, but I don't think it will change the dynamics of urbanization, and it could well accelerate it. Um, especially because a lot of these big firms now are moving out of big cities. Uh, you know, Amazon's looking did it, and went in a bidding war with all sorts of places to move out of where it is. The other, David. So, many moving parts in your story. Can you give us two or three case studies or examples of cities, even ones that weren't very successful, but for some reason or other have become so, and in those stories identify what was the critical factor or factors that, that made this transformation happen? Yeah. Well, I, I think you know, the most successful cities now are the cities in developing countries. That's where all the growth, 95% of city growth is in developing countries, and there's a chapter in the book that's, that's dedicated to this question. Um, and they are successful because they are the engines of job creation, etc. whether it's the Shenzhen's uh, of this world, uh, the way that um, Bangalore cities have developed, for example, the ability of new places just to pop up, often from almost nothing, tiny villages, even Dakar in Bangladesh was 100,000 people 50 years ago or something, and now it's 25 million people. Uh, this, this pace of growth and change, driven by the specialization, creativity, and job creation, and people basically getting jobs and escaping poverty by being in the city. Uh, that's where they escape their past. Uh, they escape it in other dimensions as well, uh, you know, oppressive parents or whatever else uh, they might be escaping. Uh, so, most of the examples are in developing countries. I think in, in the rich countries, one can look at many examples of places where the dynamics have gone the wrong way. Uh, and there are many. But there are also examples of cities uh, in the rich countries that were declining, which are now being resurrected, in a way, or reborn. And places like Cleveland, uh, Ohio, for example, uh, you see extraordinary city growth, uh, Atlanta, uh, extraordinary city growth. The interesting thing about this, and Rad Shetty, uh, the, the great economist at Harvard, has done some really interesting work on this, is who benefits when you get these cities where you've got mass poverty suddenly getting wealthy again. They were great, they declined, now they're getting wealthy again. Who benefits? It's not the poor people in the city he argues. It's new migrants coming in. Why? Because they now become knowledge cities. And the people with the old skills aren't getting the jobs. 
they may be getting the service jobs, but they're not escaping poverty. Uh, the people that are, are doing very well, that are accounting for the city growth and income generation, uh, are the new knowledge professionals. And that is true in, me, in much of what's going on in the US, where you get this resurrection of cities. So a key question is how do you get bigger spillovers both in income and job generation, from knowledge jobs to non non non. How do you get spillovers from tertiary education to other education? People used to have skills that were very tradable. A lot of those skills are no longer so tradable. And how do you get it? And how do you go from the multiplier at the moment, which is about 1.6 uh, jobs that are non-professional, created for every professional job? How do you get bigger multipliers at higher incomes? Uh, now, whether AI and generative AI is going to change this dynamic is a very interesting question. Um, yep. I have a question from Anthony online. Yep. How do you see the relationship between the city and its peri-urban and rural hinterland developing? Will it be increasingly urban-centric and extractive, or will there be a more reciprocal relationship of resources, culture, economic opportunity? Yeah. Um, that's spreading and suburbanization of cities. Uh, obviously, was generated by the automobile and to some extent by public transport, uh, metro rail systems. The, I think where we should be heading is densification in the future. In other words, we don't want bigger and bigger and bigger cities sprawling over more and more and more of the countryside, uh, both because that would be very energy efficient and because it will destroy the countryside. Uh, so, it is uh, what's happened, and of course it's been, it was the, the design structure of the, the past of cities, but if it continues, and if cities just keep growing uh, out rather than up, then I think they're going to become increasingly difficult uh, from a climate uh, point of view. I also think that the way that knowledge economies go uh, we want to be moving towards much more walkable, much more livable, much more community-oriented cities, focused around sort of a village type of city, and you can create that anywhere. And a really difficult question is what happens in the suburbs. Now, the remote, what remote work is doing is it's allowing suburbs to thrive. A lot of the restaurant chains that closed in the inner city areas now are opening in the suburbs. Uh, so you're getting whole new systems of job creation in the suburbs. The problem is that that's not where the poor people are. They can't get there very often. Uh, so how you create thriving alternative centers in the suburbs is, and whether that's going to be a place that people can get to for meaningful jobs, I think is that we're not going to, suburbs will obviously continue to exist. How you make them much more dynamic and how you make people want to live in them uh, that aren't just older people with kids, but young, pe young people who want a nightlife as well, uh, or people of diverse identities is gonna be, I think, a big question. I think we've got time for one more question. Then we're gonna have a reception to which you all invited. There's a question here. Uh, and um, you get the last word. <laughs> oh, sorry, I thought it was you, sorry. <laughs> Okay, um, you, no, you go. Two quick questions, if you don't mind. Hang on. I'm gonna, and then we'll have, there'll be drinks in the cafe next door, and I'll, um, Blackwells will be saying this book and two previous books, and, um, and I'll do a book signing. And look forward to carrying on the conversation. Yeah. So, short question, but is there a recipe for a death spiral for cities? Are there key things? Yeah, I think there is. Um, I think it's, it, I think, my own view, and it's part of what I argue in this book, is that this is a national, not a local concern. San Francisco is bankrupt. It has no money. It's got an 80 million pound uh, debt hole. So it's, it, it cannot throw money at this problem. Uh, but I believe it's a California problem. So the state uh, needs to take charge of it. It's going to destroy California if it's allowed to continue uh, as it is, as a growth pole. Uh, but I actually would go one further. Uh, is I think it's a national problem. Because these engines of growth, uh, you slow the big city growth down, you're slowing national growth down and the options 
for your future. So I believe this needs to be something which is not simply a local problem. What does it mean? It means creating affordable housing. It means clearly there's a massive crime issue and policing issues. There, there's all sorts of issues associated with it um, that need to be addressed. But I don't think San Francisco is capable of addressing them. So, partly because it's a small little city and the wealthy people all live outside it in other counties, not in San Francisco. So the income generation, although they used to get jobs there, is not there. Last word. Sorry. Oh, yeah, I, mean, I, I was actually going to pick up on the comment the gentleman made a few minutes ago about systems. And it seems to me that one could look across the world and find reasonably balanced cities in reasonable equilibrium as systems at almost any size, yep. from half a million to almost 50 million. The issue, it seems to me, is cities that are either expanding very quickly or, as you've characterized, for whatever reason, loss of a major source of employment or right now home working, where they're seeing major contraction at a rate that the system is not fluid enough to adapt. Yep. I wonder whether your book takes into account the kind of governance that might be needed either for cities that are burgeoning with growth or indeed those that might now be seeing an acute uh, reduction in demand. Yep. Clearly the governance structures, I think it's a, a really important point, the governance structures are, are vital. Um, how big the city is, and typically, and, and what I do point to, which I think is a massive issue, is that many cities are actually five or six governance structures. The, the, me the metropoles have grown way beyond the local authorities. You see it in London, but you see it everywhere. Um, and so how you create an integrated metropolitan structure while still delegating to um, as low a level as possible community affairs, neighborhoods, uh, for example, is something that, that I point to as what's needed. A much more uh, multi-tiered structure, a much, uh, uh, with much more delegated power at the local level, but also from national, and the UK is what, must be the most centralized country in the world, uh, from Whitehall to other regions, from Washington, elsewhere, uh, and how that then meets with people's needs. And clearly different things will happen at different levels. What you do with police will be very different from what you do with libraries, for example. Uh, but um, uh, that needs to, to absolutely happen, and I do, do point that. I think you all deserve a drink. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>